Hello and welcome to Downstream, Navarra's home for all the flotsam and jetsam of political culture. Apologies for the late start, but I was trying to get my CV in to Good Morning Britain. Tonight it is a live show as we do our best to abolish the monarchy, talking through the fallout of that Harry and Meghan interview with Oprah Winfrey and thinking about what this might mean for the growth or not of Republican sentiment in the UK. And here with me to chew through all the issues, we've got Moya Lothian McLean of Galdem fame. <laughs> Hello, thank you for having Just me. Just a tonight. bit of rhyming for you. I know, I was very impressed. That was off the cuff. Um, and I haven't had everyone. that before. Don't I do that. So, I feel really honest. I feel <laughs> royal. I feel of royal status. A regal. I feel like Marie Antoinette, just as she was led up the stairs to the guillotine. <laughs> And speaking of relics from centuries past, we've got James Butler in the building. Navarra's very Great, own. Great, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? I'm very well. I'm very well. I'm coming to you from the Navarra studio, which I suppose is harder to rhyme uh, with my surname. So there we go. Um, but um, yeah, I'm I'm good. I'm serene. I'm sort of uh, a little surprised at the breaking news about Piers Morgan. It really genuinely does surprise me. But um, I'm thrilled to be talking about something that, that has happened not in the, I was about to say 20th century, 21st century is the century <laughs> we're in now. <laughs> so there we go. You there, child. What day is it? Um, <laughs> it's it's Christmas Day, sire. So. Um, uh, yeah, well, I am well, in the Media Scrooge, it's true. Yeah, our political correspondent for the 18th century there. Um, so just to sort of kick off with a bit of context, I think by now lots of people have in some way metabolized the top news lines from that Harry and Meghan interview with Oprah, in which Meghan and Harry alleged that their unborn child, Archie, had been subject to racism with one member of the family raising concerns about how dark the child would be. Megan also talked about her struggles with mental health issues and feeling suicidal and receiving little to no support from the palace institution. There were also discussions about the nature of the breakaway, the uh, strange and strained relationships between Harry, his father, Charles, his father, Charles, and uh, his brother, Prince William, as well as the kind of barrage of negative briefings which potentially emerged from within the royal household itself, uh, mostly uh, targeted at Meghan. But I do just want to take a step back for a second before we get into the nitty gritty of the interview. James, let's start with you. How did we end up with the monarchy that we've got? Well, I mean, to be fair, it's, it, it, it's an enormous question. And, you know, we have what's called a constitutional monarchy. Um, the emphasis is it needs to be on both sides of that equation. So the story of how we get the monarchy that we have now is very much the story about how uh, our modes of governance uh, evolve over time. Uh, and especially, you know, so there are various ways of t telling the story that you can run back um, really to Magna Carta, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so we're going to start a little further forward than the 13th century. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the 17th century, which I think is a hugely important part of this story. So, uh, it, you know, it's quite, you know, it, it's very hard to talk about the way that we end up with the kind of monarchy that we have now without remembering that uh, we had quite a significant and very early civil war in this country, um, part of which was motivated, and it's often very it's very difficult to 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 sum up uh, everything that goes into the 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 civil war you know it get, you know even the what you call the english civil war um it, is a matter of kind of political contestation is it the war of three kingdoms is it the rebellion is it the english civil war so on and so on we'll leave that to one side um this period is very important because there's this huge conflict you know between uh the monarch on the one hand and parliament on the other there's lots of other things going on um as well uh you know, there are various things that, that aggravate them, but mostly it's a question about um, whether the king rules by consulting parliament, how often he calls parliament, and whether he has the right to uh, raise money without uh, parliament's consent, so whether he can enact ta taxes and levy taxes. Uh, and, and there are various things that feed into effectively what becomes a civil war um, parliament against the king. Uh, and that's partly because uh, parliament, when it is finally summoned to give the king, this is Charles I, some money, 
uh, it says, well, hang on, here's the problems we have with you. Charles goes, I don't think so. Uh, and then it all descends into war. Um, there are various, there are multiple wars that go on in this period. In the background here, there's also this big, big conflict between, uh, you know, to do with religion and politics. And so whether the king um, rules because he's put there by God, which is obviously a big part of, of what, you know, whether Charles believes it, whether it's something that legitimates his rule, not a question to get into here. But anyway, it's a big, big, big question. Um, and, you know, people on the parliamentary side are also motivated, um, you know, by religious thought as well. And it's kind of one of the reasons perhaps that we don't talk about this period, uh, you know, so often is that it's quite awkward for us because um, people do politics in the language of religion. Um, theology is political. You think about um, rule and governance and good governance in the kingdom um, in terms of religion. So that's all in there as well. Anyway, lots of arguments go on there. Uh, eventually, uh, they chop off Charles I's head. Very important moment. Um, lots of exciting things actually go on at this time. So, for instance, the, the new model army, the parliamentary army, has lots of radicals in it, partly because of the experience of being in an army. Um, uh, you get the levelers who emerge from that. There are the Putney debates, um, in which take place in a church, unsurprisingly enough, in Putney, um, where probably the most significant statement for democracy in the 17th century is made by a colonel um, in the army. And it's an argument about representation and um, it's a guy called Colonel Thomas Rainsborough who says, you know, for really I think that the poorest he that is in England has a life to live as the greatest he, and therefore truly, sir, I think it's clear that every man that is to live under a government ought first by his own consent to put him under that government. So there's lots of fights about representation, what that means going on there. 1688, um, after the Commonwealth, you get um, uh, 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 the, uh, the Stuart monarchy returns uh, with Charles II. Uh, lots of conflicts uh, uh, Sorry, 1660, the monarchy returns, 1688, uh, big conflict. Um, you get a Catholic monarch, effectively a Catholic monarch on the throne, uh, James II, big conflict with the aristocracy. The aristocracy um, effectively drives James out of the country, the James II, um, and invites William of Orange uh, and Mary over to rule instead. And that produces, so this is called sometimes the Glorious Revolution. It's not really a revolution at all. The real revolution, of course, has happened um, some decades earlier um, during the, the blood and uh, destruction. And it's really, I guess it's really important to emphasize here that that period of civil war, very early, one of the earliest um, conflicts to do with monarchy and uh, uh, how a country is governed, um, you know, there's lots of innovations there. The people who put King Charles on trial have to figure out how you try a king. This is uh, all new stuff to them. Um, anyway, so so you get 1688, which is kind of a pale imitation, really, of, of everything that goes on, um, you know, a, a bit before. It's a sort of ar aristocratic coup, really, um, done by pro Protestant aristocrats against a king who is, on the one hand, you know, James II, this is, who is, uh, on the one hand, you know, very unpleasantly ruling through direct prerogative power. This is you know, conflict that goes on throughout the Stuart monarchy, but is also uh, arguing in favor of religious toleration, obviously kind of motivated reasoning, he's Catholic. Anyway, so all this happens, you get the Bill of Rights, which limits, um, you know, the, the prerogatives of the monarchy, act of settlement, and then things bumble along for, for a couple of centuries um, with the powers of the monarchy getting great, you know, more gradually restricted uh, and parliamentary supremacy coming to the fore. It's a long and complicated story. We could spend many, many hours on it, which we're not going to do here. Um, last thing to say is in the mid 19th century, you get a guy called Walter Badger who writes a book, very, very famous book called The English Constitution. Um, it, it's a complicated book again, um, you know, because what it describes is the way that a sort of, so his argument is basically that a kind of republic has grown up inside the vestiges of monarchy, right? So you've got effectively what is um, a, sec, you know, a, a republic governing inside a monarchy. Um, which has symbolic power only. Um, and he likes this because he thinks, you know, um, that's great because it means that really um, the people, the, the the clan of people who are good good at governing can get on with governing. You know, he thinks of, he, as he puts it, it's the he, the upper 10,000 he wants governing. And there's another part of this story as well, of course, which is is the gradual rise of democracy, um, and which is, I, I think people should remember, really, about, you know, that's really you trace from 1832 onwards, uh, formally, but really it's a very modern story, um, only a few decades old really in this country um, that you can talk about democracy meaningfully, 1928 really. Um, so I, that's a very, very rapid um, fire tour, which is, you know, I just, so just to stress the thing here is about that, that kind of limitation of power, which arises as a consequence of there having been this enormous, very early, very bloody civil war. It's very hard 
to convey to people how bloody um, the conflict is in in this in, at this point. But it's it's huge. It affects every family in England. Often, it's families against each other. And so the interesting thing that happens, of course, is that after the restoration, like there's an there's an impetus to kind of avoid bloodshed wherever possible, which is probably what why you get this sort of weird aristocratic coup d'état, which is also why you get at various points um, a desire to avoid kind of all out conflict again partly because the memory it endures for quite for quite so a long I'm time i'm just going to put a pin in you right there for a <laughs> second um because that, that really was a whirlwind whirlwind tour of the development of constitutional monarchy um i just want to encourage all of our lovely viewers to share the link like the video it's good for the algorithm and i'd like to apologize profusely to owen jones for accidentally going live at the same time as him but what can i say i'm a royal correspondent and there's royal business afoot <laughs> Um, Moya, I'd like to turn to you because it seems to me one of the really strange elements, we've talked about the kind of constitutional element of the monarchy, but I'd like to talk about some of the personalities involved and this business of having a royal family. Because one of the things that Megan said in the interview, which I found really quite interesting, um, was that she said that, look, as an American, I just thought of the royal family as like a really famous family, except they're not that. There's obviously the connections to land ownership. They're known as the firm for a reason. They're a family with an entire institution and machine backing them. Um, there's a role in terms of Britain's you know, non-constitution, um, the inheritance of the role of being head of state. So could you just tell me a bit about what is the royal family? Oh, you're on mute. Can you there hear you me now? Okay, fantastic. Uh, I don't know if you're actually asking the right person about what is the <laughs> royal family per se, because for me, they've also been this, you, it's funny, you learn about them in school as sort of this, this assumption, it's this, it's this, it's this assumed knowledge that you, the royal family are just the family that sits the head of state and automatically has this power. And you're not really sure exactly what it is. You don't ever, you're not ever really taught what they you know what jurisdiction they have it's only later in life that slowly it comes out you know the, the duchy of cornwall and the estates that they own and that you can't kill a swan and all these little things that distract us from the fact that at the end of the day the royal family are a relic they don't have i mean james can talk much more to this but and he did but um they don't have like the political power per se beyond their role now and i think it, it's interesting obviously throughout the sort of 20th century they had a much more active role we looked to the royal family for well i didn't but we history has looked to the royal family for guidance in in these matters of like you saw you know if you watch the crown you watch how the queen elizabeth having to learn to deal with many crises and as she was almost seen as a head of state without that political power but slowly that even that sort of illusion of the power disappears um and I, th I think that's that's the thing. We we hold on to this idea of the royal family as a family that somehow have a hangover of this, um, I guess you'd call it that constitutional power, that political power, but really they are nothing more than a ghost of that now. And so I, I, I would, I, I, this is probably not the answer to the question that you're asking, but I don't think the royal family stand for anything but the memory of the royal family themselves anymore. And I don't think they have any real solid power beyond that sort of aristocratic hangover, as I said, um, that that memory of what they once stood for. So, what is, when you say what you know, what are the royal family? I think they're, I think they're almost like dust. They're air. They're our history, and they're not our present, and they're not our future. And but the the, the sort of collective understanding of them in the country hasn't yet caught up with that. I mean, so I really want to sort of um, push this point about family because what's so strange about what it is we've seen is that internal family dynamics of who's married who and get who gets on with whose in-laws essentially has turned into a crisis of national identity who we are there's a reckoning with the nature of the press and we've also sort of danced this dance before of course with the abdication crisis uh, earlier in the 20th century when um edward the which edward was he seven Eight. 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 Fuck me, there's a lot of Edwards. Yeah, because there's six and there's seven and then there's eight. I can't do Roman numerals very well, so don't ask me. I know, I'm like I'm like Edward the V. Oh, no, wait. Yes, V is V. The Nazi one. The Nazi one. The Nazi one. Edward the Nazi. For, 
those of our viewers who um, don't, don't know about this, um, Edward VIII and uh, Wallace Simpson, after the abdication, met with Hitler at the against the advice of the UK government. Uh, there are also papers which emerged, which some argue show some kind of plot to invade Britain and reinstall Edward VIII as king. Um, it's one of those things which the royal family has been very good at hushing up until the crown hit Netflix. Um, but I want to just come back to this point about family. So family is so crucial. And so who you choose to marry, who you choose to have children with becomes a matter of national importance. We saw that with Edward VIII. And then of course, with Diana. And here you had a heir to the throne, who isn't just heir to the throne, but will then become the head of the Church of England wanting to get a divorce. And then you've got it again, uh, with Prince Harry. So uh, James, if I could invite you to sort of talk about the role of family, um, the role of what we would think of as fairly well, you know, not for your Judith Butler, you wouldn't think of marriage and childbearing as apolitical. <laughs> but um, generally, you would think of as perhaps not being of, of national importance. There's this element of biopolitics here that I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, no, no, no. I see, I see where you're going with it, it, it and I, I agree. I mean, it's 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 curious in some ways that that this sort of family is at the central, you know, occupies this place so centrally in our national myth, um, it, and it and it really does. I mean, you know, it's it's astonishing the the you know, and this is one of the things that that people who are not who are outside the country are, are just astonished about how central it is to the national conversation. Uh, it, you know, so I suppose one of the things that's difficult here is that you know I think we have to try and strike a balance, and it's always it's always difficult when when criticizing institutions like this is that. You know, one can recognize the way in which even the people who apparently benefit from these institutions, including these people with their, you know, big houses and lovely crowns and whatever, you know, are also damaged by it. And it's true of the class system in general. You know, like it doesn't mean that we don't want to abolish, you know, class um, just because we, you know, we can recognize that um, the ruling class are as damaged, perhaps not as damaged, um, by their institutions, differently damaged. Um, than the rest of us are, so, and I, I, you know, I think that's important. It's a much harder thing to navigate than to say, well, well, these people are all just, you know, parasites anyway. So who cares about any of them? Um, at the same time, it's astonishing how persistent the way that we talk about uh, monarchy is. Yeah, so I was thinking, you know, I was watching this interview, and then they come out with, uh, oh, you know, but it's not the queen. It's her advisors. Mm. Like, this is Richard the Second. Like, they, I mean, you know, they, 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 what, what is this? You know, it's 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 astonishing that the persistence of this stuff. Um, you know, it's 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 kind of amazing. The other side of this, you know, and, and you know, we're talking about marriage and you know bloodlines and descendants. It all gets a bit chronic and you know like sinister and uh, like one step away from eugenics, or not even really one step away from eugenics, because that, that's the other it's thing that I think is around this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking, you know, it really put me in mind, this whole thing has put me in mind of that. Do you know, do you remember there was this scandal? It's not, it wasn't really a scandal, but it was th this image or, or this video circulated of the father-in-law of Dominic Cummings, a guy called Humphrey Wakefield. Um, ah. you, know, you know, lives in a castle, is an aristocrat, and was, you know, and came out with this thing. And his his real faux pas was to say this on record in public, whereas most of the aristocracy... Um, know perfectly well that you don't say this stuff in public anymore but it's, it was all to do with you know the way in which uh you know he believed that basically blood will out and aristocracy people who live in um big houses are there because they've achieved something and they are and that people are um you know i i can't he didn't use uh, the expression uh, uh you know people are in service of their genes or something like that uh, you know that that the, the we are ruled by our genetics and it's really this 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 kind of yeah, you know, deeply sort of, and it's that, that is the common sense of the aristocracy. There's all of this stuff is in there, and it's really, really quite unpleasant. So, Amoy, I'll invite you to come in on that because I could see you doing the facial expressions the of face. that's kind of fucked up. Um, it was, it was that, but it was also I was going to say I think it's less about the notion of family and more about the notion of dynasty, which I think James nodded to, and I think it speaks. The royal family speak very deeply. They are the pinnacle of sort of the dynasty the ruling dynasty which tramples all underfoot and that subjugation that britain somehow has got in its bloodstream and loves on every level it prevents like it it no it it what's the word it's we like boot we know we <laughs> like boot and 
the royal family have always been a symbol of like that boot and we've been able to project i think i say we it's not like i've done this but i suppose in some way it's like i just assume they're always there and the projections that we have for the royal family it's like yes it's that idea of family but i think it's more about that i think it's that unpleasantness and that sufferance and that sort of like there's nothing we can do about it they this dynasty are going to continue and it's just like the same sort of sufferance we feel in our own lives britain britain is a very like a com well england i speak of england very much here it's very much a country of like doing stuff under sufferance and you know no matter how unpleasant your family are you still have to hang out with them no mm. matter how unpleasant the class system is then you know you just have to follow the rules you follow that social strata and the royal family have always been sort of like at the top of that the pinnacle the totem and it's like as you say it even affects those within it but it's this institution that is so much bigger and you know if that crumbles it's almost like we have to question every single thing about the way this country is set up and run and the aristocracy and the inbreeding and whether that's really the you know the way to create a happy balanced society or perhaps whether that is just a way to perpetuate mi misery through generations and it's, it's that idea again of we you talked about eugenics it's very much built in eugenics it's like the royal family is seen as it's amazing i don't know how this myth of sort of like purity is attached to them given that they uh, as i say they've been bred over centuries and centuries between this very small pocket um and the royal family what's interesting about this particular bit of the royal family is that we talked about this before royal families usually switched over so you had different dynasties coming in and killing each other and then someone else would swap in and someone else would kill each other but then when the killing started being a bit too vulgar and a bit too sort of um gruesome then it just stayed with this one and this this is why it's so stale i think and this is why they're also petering out to such a not with a bang but with a whimper end mm. because um that's not the way it always went even in previous days gone past it was just a new dynasty would take over when they were more powerful but this one is just left to its own devices to rot from the inside out but yeah i think it, i think it's more about dynasty than family and those bonds of sufferance um rather than choice i mean i want to i want to chime in on this because i've got so many opinions on posh people misery despite <laughs> having never been posh but got so many opinions on it because i think one thing is that you know, the royal family is a deeply miserable institution, it makes the people inside it miserable. And that in itself is turned into a kind of inerrant nobility. So there is a projection that we put upon the queen as this kind of long suffering grandmother. And that's part of the story of her nobility. But that misery is also sort of, I think it's part and parcel of the boarding school system. Um, I think that sending children away at the age of 11 years old to what is essentially an abuse factory is a kind of suboptimal way to raise your kids and when that happens in the context of of, of working class and, and very deprived families kids get sent into care we go that's not great for kids but when they get sent to Eton or Gordiston it's like oh well done those parents have done the very best they can for a little talk in there but it's a way of, of, of kind of valorizing um, making people miserable and that misery being a condition of their suitability to rule. And then I just wanted to kind of briefly um, talk about the, the point that James raised about eugenics. Um, it's not just close to eugenics. The, the royal family, of course, um, have had people born within it who have had disabilities. There was uh, the Queen's cousins, Catherine and Nerissa, who were um, diagnosed having developmental disabilities. They were hidden away at the Royal Ellswood Hospital and they were struck from the big book of aristocratic births, right? There were death dates put in there to make them seem like they died in childhood, just so nobody would ask, nobody would ask questions. Um, but I want to talk about what you were saying about the kind of almost this ghostliness, the royal family stands in for the memory of previous royal families, is that once upon a time, the aristocracy was the pinnacle of glamour. And I'm thinking here, James, about the Scriblerians who wrote an awful lot of poetry about these aristocratic women who wore these huge dresses, the rape of the lock famously about Belinda with her hair. Um, you also kind of have this, um, sense of a social scene, a party scene um, of these incredibly glamorous, stylish people. And people thought of that as either trivial or something to aspire to. Whereas now the British aristocracy, I said this on Tiski Sour last night, they smell a bit like wet dog. They're horsey. The houses seem to be in a state of disrepair. Is this useful branding to conceal how much they still own, they still extract? Or is there an element of truth that they're kind of parochial and provincial these days? I don't get invited to shooting parties, so I don't know. 
<laughs> well, um, for 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 the for clarity for our, our viewers, neither do I. <laughs> Just me. But you know, I mean, it's. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it'd be one of us. Uh, I mean, you know, like it, it's it, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, I, I think. You know, one of the things you pointed to Scriblerians there is actually really interesting because one of the things it tells us is that, um, you know, the public sphere and sort of, you know, fascination with these people is much older than just the culture of the image and the culture of the moving image. It, it is not, you know, and and one of the stories of Britain, one of the things that makes that, that makes it so odd to talk about, you know, is that. I think for a lot of us, some of us think like the normal progression of a nation is like France, right? That you have a king, then you kill him, and then you <laughs> sort of have a series of, you know, you, you have a series of kind of back and forth, like where you try to figure out how to set up a republic. But basically, there are kind of clear breaks when, you know, one system of government becomes another system of government. In the right? words of Danton, you do not negotiate with tyrants. The only <laughs> way in which you can negotiate with a king is through armed force. Right. Well, exactly. I mean, you know, and plenty of other people as well. It's true. Um, you know, I, but but here in Britain, you know, you get these kind of successive waves of, um, you know, the, the kind of rising mercantilist classes joining with and fusing with the old aristocracy. Right. And one of the things that, that the British aristocracy never really do is they never really lose their land. Right. You know, they don't have it all confiscated. Uh, so, you know, it's one of the questions, maybe we'll talk about this a bit, one of the things that aristocrats do today is that they, you know, farm. Um, it doesn't actually involve any actual contact with the land, but they make profits off, or, you know, off owning land. So they have lots of tenant farmers, various other things they do as well. Um, but, you know, I mean, ju just just on that question of kind of the, you know, because basically this is one of the problems that, that the you know contemporary royal family faces is the interface with celebrity culture, um, is the interface with, you know, the culture of the image and, you know, the culture in particular, like, look, you know, um, I, I I think I'm still pretty, you know, I, I'm pretty skeptical about the value of celebrity culture. Um, I, I, I get kind of very anxious about the impact it has, um, you know, on us as a society. And one of the, the ways that one of the things I wrestle with it is the demand for intimacy, the the desire, you know, this this kind of you know synthetic desire for intimacy with you know, someone who's very distant from us and is is actually utterly unlike us. And when that demand is placed, you know, on a monarch who is you know supposed to be in some way sort of neutral or removed from that culture then you get this kind of this this pull in these two directions i mean look celebrity culture in other ways imposes on us this kind of fantasy of intimacy but also kind of ultimately this sense of of homogeneity and kind of interesting mm. everyone's really the same that you can relate to these people however however different they are for you um so yeah i mean there's all this stuff going on here and it, it points to one of the, the you know because the real question for me is like why could these people not use Meghan markle in the way that seems obvious mm. that you would use her right which is to allow her to 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 gradually bring you into contact with the way in which society is changing um so it's it's it, i don't know it seems very difficult it, it's it, it's difficult to know you know that difficulty in using her points to something about the institution of monarchy that that maybe has finally hit um it, its end point at the same time though you know i mean again maybe we can come and talk this i'm not sure it's going anywhere so we've almost got 2,000 people watching the show. So smash that like button, share the link to the show. And most importantly, subscribe to this channel. Um, if enough of you subscribe to this channel, then we will abolish the monarchy. It will just happen automatically. It's actually written <laughs> into YouTube's terms and conditions. But Moya, I'd love for you to come in on this. So what did Meghan Markle represent to the royal family, both in terms of what she could have represented and what she ended up representing? Oh, goodness. Um, I think what she could have represented was quite obvious because for a while she did. She represented the modernization of the royal family and she represented, and I don't want to spend, I mean, the thing is, I think that her being biracial was very important. In the end, it became of overwhelming importance at this position. At the start, it was quite important. It was seen as this, you know, wow, they really managed to pick someone who fits in all these, you know, she's biracial, but she she's very palatable, she's so beautiful, she's an American actress. This is the most sort of like anti-Britain moral family that you can get. And she was marrying Harry, so she was almost safe. She wasn't going to inherit the throne. So she, you know, she wasn't going to mess up that line of succession by being too modern. Um, she was she was marrying the spare, also the cuckoo in the nest. Harry had always <laughs> been a bit of like 
apart from the Nazi outfit and his various thing he'd been a sort of like secret fan favorite even among I think um the more anti-monarchy people in the I audience. thought you were referring to uh the James Hewitt I was I was with I was very the... much ah. I was very much referring to those rumors I meant he was the spare and he was the cuckoo in the nest mm -hmm. um yes yeah I was um I'm just gonna say get out the like um 23 and me kit and then we can talk uh, so <laughs> it's yeah so harry harry was like the spare it's like he was it was the safe it was a safe option for her to marry in that sense um he'd always been you know he's been seen very much as diana's son he was he didn't like the press very much he'd made his sort of as much as someone within his position and his i would say amount of enlightenment around his own family goes he was quite anti the circus that came with it and even then um i think it was a celebrity circus i i do i do think and i'll get into this in a minute that the celebrity culture and the royal family fused a lot earlier than perhaps we give it credit for mm. um and it was the royal family themselves who were perhaps resistant and misunderstood that that happened which is one of the reasons they're so decrepit but megan yeah she represented this like modernity she was got a whole generation interested i watched that royal wedding with actual interest I was excited to see her dress. When Kate walked down the aisle, I didn't care at all. It was on, but I didn't give a shit. Um, <laughs> so, you know, and like the Pippa Middleton, et cetera. That was I like always, if you want to look at how consent is manufactured in this country, look at how um. <laughs> they imposed this idea that Pippa Middleton has a good bum. Yeah. As far as I can tell, her legs but her back. And that was the end of the story. But it was just like Pippa Middleton was thick. That was that was the that's con that's consent manufacturing right there. <laughs> and I don't mean thick with a CK, I mean thick with a double C. So Megan, you know, Megan was this she was she was beautiful, she was elegant, she was so charismatic, and she was very good at the job. That was the funny thing. She was excellent at the job. Immediately she wanted to be part of this machine and she was good at it. And that's what she could have represented. She could have represented, sadly, a real continuation and like um, I think a quelling of anti-monarchy sentiment among younger mm. generations because it's easy to go along with things when there is someone you feel more softly towards, even if you're like, I'm very much like burn it all down and I feel sympathy for them, but also, sorry, you're still very rich. Um, but but like, I know other people are like, they really saw themselves or they really were able to project onto Megan in a way that they hadn't been able to before. And that was very powerful. However, what she came to represent was, it, and it was all their own doing. She came to represent sort of the most, she was Diana part two. She's literally Diana part two. And that's the thing, She's she's, and she's, the thing is she's still alive. And so she represents this outpouring and she's got this voice. So there's a whole new connection she has with this audience that she built, you know, um, organically anyway, through social media, through her career previously. She had a whole life. There was so much documented footage of her before that. She wasn't, you know, this very young, small virgin plucked out of private school. She was a fully grown woman with a whole life before her. So we knew the kind of person she was and her values and or at least the values she professes to have, et cetera. So, she she had a voice and she became almost like the way to channel both the frustrations of Diana, but also to channel the frustrations of the way I think um, pop feminism wants to talk about women. I think the way Meghan Markle has been talked about and probably the way I'm talking about is very sort of binary. It's very like classic, like, you know, she's this, she's this really wronged woman who's, you know, she's a woman of color and she ticks every single box of discourse that we want to discuss right now um and she's almost it's, it's really funny to see how many people on the left have just taken her to their hearts because of the way she's been wronged by this institution and the way that we think in absolute so she has to be this 100 percent good thing um even while you know there's this because they're the 100 percent bad thing and that's what i think she represents now she represents she represents every single point of discourse <laughs> about identity politics and sort of like this like, like this modernity versus the decrepitness of the royal family and this old institution but at the same time to me personally she also represents like and i think you're talking about this ash in a really interesting way like marketization and commodification of that sort of like them like powerful woman girl boss feminism thing and neoliberalism in that sense and the the where the power now lies the power lies in you know getting your deals with netflix and apple and your interview with oprah and moving to america and as you said being part of that brand new sort of multiracial aristocracy so that to me is the Meghan markle story and i think she this is this is just what she's projected on this is what just the public image she has because she seems like a very nice woman at the, her heart and i feel so terrible about all the things that have happened to her but it, there's no she's she's not like a 
left left wing burn it all down she still says she'd want to be part of that family it's just that family treated her awfully so she's moved to a new one i mean does this tell us something about how the ruling class works in Britain versus how the ruling class works in America. Because there is, I mean, I use the word aristocracy to kind of speak to that role in taste making at being at, you know, the top of the tree and very ensconced within money, but it's not just about being rich. It carries with it all of these norms around the kind of nobility and superiority of who you are. Obviously it's associated with accomplishment in America, um, Oprah is, you know, kind of like heartedly known as the queen of America, but she's the queen of, of American broadcast television, um, Beyonce and Jay-Z. I've always said Kim K too tacky, but we'll see what happens after the divorce <laughs> from Kanye. Um, Ellen DeGeneres, George W. Bush being rehabilitated into it. Jared and Ivanka could have been in there, but perhaps tarnished um, by, their, by their proximity to Trump. Um, but there's something distinct about the American ruling class, which is different um you know it's it's a it's a plutocracy perhaps um there's obviously the role of money but there is the sense that you have to at least be able to tell a story of accomplishment whereas i'm not sure if you agree with this james but it seems to me that the british aristocracy is always declaring its own amateurishness um there's a lack of professionalism there's a lack of polish which distinguishes the British Old Boys Network. Yeah, I mean, I agree, and I think that's absolutely true. I also know there's there's something um, just I, f I find pretty culturally repulsive about Britain a lot of the time, which is <laughs> this idea that like uh, being over earnest or trying at something or uh, you know taking something seriously is somehow a mark of gaucheness. Well, I mean, it is a mark of leftness in this case. Um, but, but you know, that you're somehow kind of like utterly weird for doing it. And I, I hate it. I hate it. Obviously, I hate it. It's not but does that come from the idea of sprezzatura? So sprezzatura, for those unfamiliar, yeah. it was the um, term for sort of courtly effortlessness, that you can never be seen mm -hmm. to be trying. You just glide like a swan. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, but even, but, but, you know, I mean, even there, that suggests that there's some kind of effortless end product i'm quite quite a fan of the idea of sprezzatura anyway but like um it you know it, it you know the idea you know but as you say like often in britain like that you know you, something is crap and that's the thing that makes it you know uh uniquely ours i mean yeah i think i think this is true and i think you know th that that also goes along with like look you know i i banged on a bit about the civil war at the, the beginning of the show because i do think it's important um because one of the reactions to it has been this sort of myth or the, the kind of intense propagation of this myth that you know, British people are not really that interested in politics, don't really care about how they're governed. You know, taking that seriously is just like weird and ideological. Um, and it tells us that this certainly wasn't always historically true. Like people cared enormously, cared enormously, cared enough to go out and, and fight about it, cared enough to die for it. I mean, I think that's really important. And it's, you know, it connects, you know, one of the things that really worries me. So, you know, I think it's very easy to get into like these these conversations on the left about, you know, it, it would be very easy and we haven't done this and I'm very glad about it. It would be very easy for us to sit here and go like, oh, well, the, you know, the royal family is bad for this, this, this and this reason. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, they need to be abolished. Um, you know, it's, it's simple and it's clear. And in one sense, obviously, it's true. It's a completely risible and laughable thing that we're governed by someone, um, you know, nominally governed by someone, however effectively you want to talk about it, nominally governed by someone, you know, who is, who is who, who, you know, who rules us, who rules us as subjects, um, because her great, 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 great grandfather was the offspring of the corpse of Sophia Electress of Hanover. Um, you know, this is this is ridiculous. And you go further back. Well, it's because you know someone was more violent than my ancestors, mm. uh, and they 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 pillaged and dispossessed them of land. Well, I mean, what a completely risible idea. Just as an act of basic political hygiene, we should regard this as disgusting because everything that goes along with it. Um, it says that, you know, blood is what out. It says it, the, all this eugenic stuff we've, we've been talking about, it's there, you know, simmering under, under you know, the question of monarchy. And I think this is, it's important because as soon as we get to a position where we just go, oh, well, you know what, British people don't really care about politics and there's no way 
in which you can never make them care about the fact that they're nominally, symbolically governed by a monarch. And you think, well, maybe that's true. It probably wouldn't be at the top of my priority list. But like, I worry, I worry about this because I worry about the, you know, I worry, especially at the moment, you know, look, in the middle of the 20th century, it was possible to think that the monarchy wouldn't end, wouldn't last to the 21st century. Quite possible to think that. Right. It's quite easy now to think that it will endure until the 22nd. Why is that? I worry that we're at a place that we're we're encountering this kind of ebbing of democratic sentiments. Right. That we're, we're encountering mm. you know, the, the, the sense of these kind of basic freedoms, these basic things that we value about how we govern ourselves, about the, you know, the fact that my vote should matter as much as Elizabeth Windsor's and not a jot more. Um, that you know, the, the, that there is something kind of fundamental about this claim, um, you know, that, that, that is important. I, I worry that this is going away uh, at mm. the same time, because and I, I, I worry about what it can bring back, right? And, and at the same time, you know, curiously, during lockdown, I've been reading a lot of Dante. And Dante wrote a tract in the 13th century, uh, well, the beginning of the 14th century, actually. He writes a tract called Monarchia, right, on monarchy. And it's not really about monarchy in the sense that we would know it. It's about, you know, it's basically an early argument for separation of church and state. But it comes out of the fact that he has experienced this life that is utterly riven by factional politics. And he kind of is fantasizing about what it would be like to live in a community governed by one will where faction and and including the, the corruption of his own side right it's the thing that makes Dante often very moving is like he's talking about like the, the the recognition after he's lost and is in exile that even his own side was kind of corrupt and did awful mm. things and he probably kind That's of the kind of place where Milton ends up as well exactly after the English Revolution and he's like well gosh you know the, the, these guys on my side perhaps not so great either so and later, what I'm saying here is like this desire for like to overcome the reality of politics, fantasy about, you know, uh, about monarchy. It's all there bubbling in the background. I think we should just remember that, like, democracy is a very fragile thing and so difficult to achieve, and it's something that we should value. So we have got uh, 769 likes, and I would be really gassed if we could get that to at least 1,000. So if you're watching the show, thank you very much. But also, it ain't for free. Smash the like button. That's the, that's the, that's the <laughs> that's price the of entry, babes. Um, but, Moy, I, I want to turn to you with this, which is, at various points in in our lifetime, when mm. there has been a crisis within the royal family, and it's been to do with family predominantly, people have predicted there's a crisis of legitimacy for the royal family. There's no way they could survive Diana. There's no way they could survive Meghan. And then earlier it was there's no way they could survive the abdication. Now, of course, they did. So two questions. One, do you think that this moment will be a radicalizing moment for younger generations with very different social norms um, with regards to republicanism? And if not, why not? That is a very difficult question because I hate making predictions. Because I'm uh, always wrong. <laughs> I'm always, always wrong. And I think also because I exist in a bit of you know a bubble I exist on a social media bubble where yeah my timeline seems very radicalized by this but that doesn't mean that everyone is radicalized this and it also means that lots of people out there are ignoring it because it's just a stream of fatiguing news which I think is also something important to remember I, I I almost didn't watch the interview myself because I was like I'm fed up of hearing about this but I pushed myself to do it because it was important in that sense and I knew that I should like I should but I think we shouldn't over um underestimate how fatiguing a constant stream of news about one topic is to people at this point in time um so whether that might have an effect is one thing in terms of radicalizing I don't know I I genuinely I genuinely just want to say I don't know because I, as you said it's like we imagine that Thing, the cruelty of the royal family in this scenario is such that, you know, Meghan said she had suicidal ideation and she had no help from that. Something like that, watching her say that was a really just like a very stark humanizing moment to such a degree that it seems like Piers Morgan may or may not allegedly have been sacked for denying that she felt those things. So, you know, that, that cut through. But... I, I do worry that, as James was talking about, there's this fatigue. There is a fatigue in general with the idea that things can change or that we can change them or that we can pool our resources to change them. And perhaps this is also, you know, I'm always going on about online sort of styming offline efforts because we get caught up in discourse as opposed to like doing actual things. And the pandemic has exacerbated that because we mm. can't get outside. Um, but that's something I do wonder, you know, like that, that fatigue and that do 10 years plus almost 
10 years plus now yeah 10 years plus of tory tory governance and sort of the apathy and you know post iraq war remembering that the march of hark what was it quarter of a million people biggest march ever didn't mean anything doesn't change anything that slow realization that at the moment we're living in an era where your voice does matter but it also doesn't matter in the ways that you think it does I, I don't know quite how to like articulate that it matters when you know you're coming out and voting for what the politicians want in like on mass falling for the lies of brexit but it doesn't matter as such when you're trying to like push you know radical or not even a radical a quite moral agenda of sort of, sort of social change that would provide for more people that's when it doesn't matter it's, it's in this sense this is one of those things that republicanism is seen as a left-wing thing mostly i think and things that are seen as left wing often quite tarnished at this point in time. Um, and I, I just don't think that, you know, let's take Keir Starmer as a weather vane. I'm sorry for bringing him up, but let's take him as the weather vane. Is Keir Starmer going to call for the end of the royal family anytime soon? Is he going to make the actual case that, you know, maybe we should stop funding this family and maybe we should, after Queen Elizabeth dies, we should really reconsider their position in society and their position as nominal heads of state. I can't see someone like Keir Starmer doing that. And if I can't see someone like Keir Starmer doing that, I can't see another politician doing that because he's like the most middle road, trying to please the public mood right now, always gets it wrong, but still trying to please the public mood. And that's why in terms of like Republicanism for my generation, if I can't see that cry being made, I see people just sort of like letting it fade into the background because there are so many other things that we are distressed about right now that seem so much more pressing and so much closer in a way. The royal family mm. is, is like, it's great gossip. It's fantastic gossip to us. But the actual consideration of the impact they have on our lives goes under the rug. It's like I was talking about earlier, you know, you don't hear about like the estates they own and the money they've squirreled away and just how much it costs to upkeep them. And actually, do they pay, you know, are they are they paying for their way in the sense of like the tourism that they bring in? Because you see it here, all these like things about the tourism that they bring in. But I, I, I feel like if they were got rid of the tourism would still come in and it would still be looking at like the Tower of London, but it would just be looking at their not heads on spikes. It would be looking at, you know, <laughs> it would be looking at, please don't arrest me. Um, it would be looking at the crown jewels and it would be looking at the relics. It would be looking at Queen mm. Elizabeth's last crown that she ever wore before, you know, the monarchy was abolished. And that would still be going on in that sense because that nostalgia and the retrospective would, element would still be there. And that's what the monarchy is, as we talked about. It's that ghost. I mean, people people go to Versailles. In fact, more visited mm. than than British attractions. Um, and maybe without the sort of magic of a queen potentially living in it, people see Buckingham Palace for what it is, which is kind of a tired provincial hotel. Yes. Um, I do, I do, I do think is is, is absolutely hideous. Um, but I want to, I want to pick up. Um, I want to pick up. Uh, sorry, I was so struck by your hot takes isn't praxis. I'm sort of <laughs> sitting here wounded. I'm like, God, at me next time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I want to talk about ah, republicanism because every Labour leader has had to moderate their position on republicanism. Jeremy Corbyn had to. So the closest he ever got to saying what he really thought when he was Labour leader was when he was asked in that 2019 debate about Prince Andrew, uh, what do you think about the royal family? And he went, needs a bit of improvement. And that he was very strong on the issue of Epstein and Prince Andrew, but he didn't say like, look, these people are fucking parasites and they've got no place in a modern democracy, which I imagine is something akin to what he really thinks. Um, <laughs> if we go for Labour prime ministers, you've got Harold Wilson, who was a Republican. And then from being prime minister, that position softened. He ended up being one of the Queen's favourite prime ministers to sit down with every week. Um, and the only prime minister apart from Churchill to be granted a private dinner at Downing Street. So that oh, gives you a now. sense of the way in which um, he was co-opted, right? And the way in which it became a very cosy part of the establishment. And that was Harold Wilson. So, you know, thinking about, I think a lot about how we live in, in, in nominal democracies, but how the choices in front of us are so constrained. And I was thinking about this in the American general election, how every single election Americans have been able to vote in, they've never had the option of a candidate who supports universal health care free at the point of use. To what extent can you call that a functioning democracy? And in this country, to what extent can you call it a functioning democracy when you haven't had a major party leader maintain a stance of republicanism while leading the party, um, putting that forward as a, as a policy issue? Um, you know, James, do, do you think that we'll ever see a 
party leader brave enough to take their stance and what would it take to make that happen yeah i i, I mean not in the near future i mean i think it's the answer to that i mean on the one hand i, I something something more you were saying earlier it really reminded me of a letter that the regicide john cook writes from prison to his wife so the, the evening before he's killed and you know he's reflecting so he, this is the guy who basically prosecuted charles the first right like he has to invent a, a way to prosecute a king incredible like bit of a personal hero actually <laughs> Uh, I'm always available for the job if, if, if <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but so, so, so he writes to his wife, he says, you know, um, uh, uh, we fought for the public good, um, and we would have enfranchised the whole of the groaning creation had the nation not more delighted in servitude than in freedom. Mm. Um, which, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a very easy thing for, for radicals to slip into, right. Is to get this sense that, um, that, that public opinion is, 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 intrinsically conservative and unchangeable and i don't think that's true on the other hand i do think that we should basically be thinking like we're living in a one-party state um mm. probably a, for another decade frankly i don't think that's actually all Keir Starmer's fault um i, I think there's some serious deeper things things deeper than Keir Starmer, which is a hell mm. of a lot of things um <laughs> going on there um what i would say is one of the reasons that this presents itself as a paradox to us is that the existence of a kind of, you know, so I, if I'm talking about the constitution, I, I often start by telling this story about a key part of the constitution, which is a pseudonymous letter sent to the Times newspaper in 1950, right? And it was signed Senex. And it was uh, actually written by Tommy Lassels, who uh, uh, viewers of The Crown will know. The mustache um, and it's about, man. <laughs> and it's about what happens um, if there's a hung parliament and then what, what role the monarch plays in deciding who to appoint as prime minister. And then you step back and think, okay, well, isn't it kind of crazy that a nation should be run, a key part of how a nation is run is defined by, an, by a pseudonymous letter to a newspaper um, you know, this isn't a great work of constitutional theory. It's a guy writing to a paper, you know, and giving the nod to someone he knows, which is a way into realizing that, you know, because we've had this kind of, you know, hush, hush, nod, nod, wink, wink settlement for so many centuries, Britain has never really developed a native theory of the state. It's never really understood even kind of, you know, we don't have a, you know, a, a, uh, what what an academic would call a kind of native republican tradition in the same way that France does, right? So France has a lot of writing about what it means to to have a state, and um, what it means to govern a state, what it's for. And there's lots of arguments about this stuff. Not so much the case in Britain. Um, the other side of this is is that you know, that, and one of the consequences of this actually in some ways is that Britain is a very poorly discussed. You know, actually we're talking about democracy. Britain isn't a democracy. Britain is a very poorly disguised oligarchy which occasionally undertakes exercises um, in, in a sort of nominal consent making. And this is a thing that has worried governments in the past, or, or, or actually, you know, people, especially when they're in opposition. You know, if I count Hailsham in the 70s, like, you know, this is the period in which Labour looks like it's the natural party of government. If I count Hailsham, who's a Tory, um, starts to worry about elective dictatorship and the kind of powers that are accorded to him. You know, when the Tories come back in, he's suddenly finds he's not so concerned about it anymore but the, the kind of huge powers that that, that a government has so all of this stuff you know, it, you know it, it takes us to this paradox which is that yes the monarchy doesn't have anything in the way of kind of absolute power it has enormous connections enormous soft power enormous lobbying power within the british state which is something we don't really talk about enough especially when it comes to the question of land mm -hmm. but you know i mean one of the reasons to take it on is that it would be part of a conversation about Britain finally becoming a grown-up nation. I mean, you know, it, it, about us finally becoming a community of adults who can think about what the state is for, what we use it for, how we're governed, and, you know, what our decisions mean as citizens. You know, do, do our, can our decisions only go so far? Can they not, you know, must they tremble before a throne forever? Mm. What a preposterous idea. So we're coming towards the end of our show, and Moya, I kind of want to give you the last word. No, here. don't give me the last word. I will give Chase the last word. The last word here, very quickly, on Piers oh Morgan's God. departure from GMB. Uh, so far, it seems that he's left, but I'm sure we will get more information on whether that was um, whether he was pushed 
as opposed I to feel like, okay. I, I feel like it had a lot to do with ITV's mental health campaign is all I'm going mm-hmm. to say that Piers Morgan's departure came so soon afterwards and perhaps and I also think that perhaps his um funnily enough him going after so many Tory ministers had alienated a key part of GMB's viewership a little bit so perhaps he was more expendable than we think he was well I've got to say that's probably been the most surprising turn of events in the last um, few days for me because I kind of thought that what GMB is always very good at is it sucks up and sort of regurgitates its own critiques from within. And that's the role that Susanna plays. That's the role that Alex Beresford plays. And so I kind of thought that there wouldn't be a significant ruction or departure. Um, Though I do wonder if Piers Morgan might be connected to one of these new, new... new news channels which are emerging either gb news or or the other murdoch one which is going to pop up at some point i i do doubt it's gb news because i feel like the uh rivalry with andrew neil and the clash of egos might be perhaps too great (laughs) for Piers to either come crawling to andrew or for andrew to let him in but i will say this if Piers morgan can be sacked from gb news maybe there's hope of republicanism in this country yet (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i think that's i think that's a really good note to end on um thank you both so much for joining me moya lothian mclean and james butler if thank you. you guys liked this video you know that there's more where this came from if you subscribe to our channel you can also get alerts i think if you press the little bell so you'll know whenever we're going live and of course we always appreciate your Uh, financial support as well because we don't have duchies to sustain us so if you liked this content and you want to bung us a few quid just go to navaramedia.com forward slash support and I promise if I ever marry um, you know one of those chinless inbred aristocrats and I'm suddenly rolling in it I'll stop begging you for cash but until that day um, I I will be shaking you upside down for your lunch money so thank you James and Moya for joining us tonight and thank you for uh, watching bye